like to call this meeting to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, present this evening are myself, Mayor Marl, Council Members Burgoyne, Gearbaugh, Peters, Rhodes, Roth, and Tahar. From staff, we have City Manager Campbell, Clerk Royal, City Treasurer Bennett, Business Ambassador Korfman, and our City Superintendent Engineer, Mr. Rubel. I will entertain a motion to approve the agenda as amended. There are a number of additions this evening, the first of which will appear on the consent agenda. It will be item C-13-169. It will be the approval of temporary placement of luminaries along North Ann Arbor and Michigan Ave on November 9th, 2013. It's for a wedding. And then on to the discussion portion of the agenda, we're going to remove um, a discussion on the annual audit because that's an, an action item. But we are going to add two issues, the first of which is um, regarding the TIFA budget. And the second is um, economic development in reference to an article that Mr. Burgoyne distributed. Um, you do have that article from Mr. Burgoyne, um, a copy of an email he sent um, yesterday evening, and then a revised um, general legal services contract um, provided by Scott Smith this evening. Just want to make you aware of that. If there are no um, other additions to the agenda this evening, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda as amended. Motion to approve. Move to approve as amended by Burgoyne. Is there a second? I'll second. Seconded by Mr. Peters. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ayes have it. The motion carries unanimously. We have no absences to excuse, so we'll dispense with that portion of the agenda. And we have a, a couple, well, one bittersweet uh, presentation and one that's a little bit more exciting. So at this time, I'd like to invite uh, my predecessor and our current state representative, Gretchen Driscoll, forward. Um, and in addition to bringing her forward, I'd like all of our friends from the Saline Historical Society to come forward as well. I actually have two. <laughs> so, Brian, Mayor Marl, you stay here uh, because obviously the Ranchler Farm's a major asset to the community of Saline. And um, so, uh, I was fortunate to attend the uh, was it the Barn of the Year Award up in Lansing, and we did a tri tribute to recognize the importance of the Ranchler Farm um, barn and the re uh, fact that it received a very uh, extraordinary um, award for the Barn of the Year. And I know that. Um, is there's not a lot of barns that get that. I think there's only, is there two every year or three? Four. Four. Okay, sorry. And um, so it's a really big deal because we obviously have a lot of barns around the state of Michigan being an agricultural state. And the m amount of time that you all have spent um, with the, doing the maintenance and uh, preservation of the barn. I know there's a lot of work. It's not just the barn. It's the whole property. But obviously the barn is of major significance. So I'd like to share the, um, and then perhaps you could share a little bit about some of the work that in the history here. But the tribute reads, let it be known, it is our pleasure to join with the Saline Area Historical Society, the city of Saline, and all of Washtenaw County in celebrating the Rentschler Farm Dairy Barn upon its nomination for the Michigan Barn Preservation Network Barn of the Year. The Rentschler Dairy Barn has become a symbol of the significant agricultural heritage of the Saline community. The barn serves as an important representation of a bygone area significant to the development of Saline. <coughs> Excuse me. A uh, private public partnership between the city of Saline and the Saline Area Historical Society have worked together to manage the rehabilitation of this historic building. Originally built in the 1860s, the barn has a rich history and continues to serve a significant purpose through its new role as a farm museum and community venue. It should also be known that the Saline community has benefited from the educational services, as I know many of you have taken tours of the barn, provided by the Agricultural Museum hosted within the Rentschler Farm Dairy Barn. In special tribute, therefore, this document is signed and dedicated to recognizing the Rentschler Farm Dairy Barn upon its nomination for the Michigan Barn Preservation Network's Barn of the Year. And I know that we have former um, presidents of the Historical Society and a lot of work and energy that's gone into 
maintaining the Rentschler Farm Museum as a whole with all of it. But Dean, if you'd like to talk a little bit more about the application, because I know it was very in-depth and it was really quite extraordinary to see all the other beautiful barns from around the state and the ones from previous years. Thank you very much, uh, Gretchen. We really appreciate all of your support over the many years that you were here as mayor, and also, Brian, as your support uh, since you became mayor. Uh, without the relationship, the public-private partnership with the city, uh, this could never have been accomplished. And we really appreciate all the support from the city, the city council, Todd Campbell, uh, Jeff Fordyce, I don't know if he's here, he's a huge help for us. Uh, and of course, uh, the members of the society, uh, the board of directors, uh, Wayne Clements, who is the uh, previous president that started this process, uh, not just for the uh, Barn of the Year Award, but for the National Register. Uh, Dave Rhodes, who uh, followed Wayne, uh, also supported all of those activities and uh, was very instrumental in putting that information together. Uh, Kathy Fortner, who was one of our board members, made the uh, proposal to the Michigan Barn Preservation Network uh, two or three years ago. And the first year it was uh, not accepted and they came back and accepted it the second year, which was really a big surprise and very delightful for us. Uh, we had a lot of people help us with this effort. Ted Micah, who is our uh, barn doctor, helped us uh, tremendously, and many, many other supporters and volunteers, uh, lots of people that donated their time and, and treasure to help us. Uh, Cynthia Christensen, who is the chairwoman of the Historic District Commission, actually submitted uh, the uh, final proposal for the National Register and had a tremendous amount of work to uh, finish that up. So she deserves a lot of credit. Unfortunately, she couldn't be here tonight. So we wish her well in her recovery. Uh, yeah, talk about the barn. Yeah. <laughs> well, I had to go through this first. Uh, the, uh, the Rentschler Farm was acquired by the city in 1998, I believe it was. And uh, the society uh, agreed with the city to operate and manage the uh, this, the farm as a museum. About uh, four or five years ago, when Dave was uh, president, we undertook a program to uh, rehabilitate and restore the barn. It took a tremendous amount of work, including uh, foundation work, uh, replacing old rotten woods uh, in the upper floor and uh, putting in a new floor, uh, which allows us to have actually uh, performances and the Saline area players perform there uh, two or three times a year. They performed here uh, back during harvest time a month or so ago and had a great turnout even in spite of the weather. So it's, it's been a tremendous effort uh, to get this uh, barn to the point that it is today and uh, we're gonna work hard to try to keep it there. So thank you very much for okay. this honor. Yeah, and, okay. Great, thank you. And so I also, um, so it's really great because I actually have been meaning to bring in the barn tribute and then you received the award and Brian, if you want to come over here and on behalf of recognizing the city of Saline for their dedication to preserving a very important part of our heritage. And I always admire it because it, it's in, and you've heard me say this before, in juxtaposition to our old Ford plant. I think it's a really in, um, a great visual of the history of the city of Saline and the community of Saline and um, our, a lot of our roots, which are also recognized in the, our city seal here. But the great work that the city in partnership with the Historical Society for maintaining the whole property. Uh, that being uh, recognized on the National Register is a huge undertaking. Uh, we've talked about that for many, many, many years, and so kudos to the city and the Historical Society for doing that work. We also have, and this, this was my personal tribute from my being very impressed by the uh, barn preservation, but this is actually signed by your senator, Randy Richerville, and also your governor, Rick Snyder. So I'll read this, this goes, to the city and um, the historical society, so I'm not really sure where it should be housed, so we'll have to discuss that That's later. The most appropriate place would be Rentschler Farm. Okay. We, can, we can discuss that at a later time. Let it be known, it is our pleasure to join with the National Park Service and the Michigan State Preservation Office in celebrating the Rentschler Farmstead's recent listing in the National Register of Historic Places. And um, the Rentschler Farmstead has been a symbol of the significant agriculture heritage of the Saline community. It serves as an important representation as we said in the barn, one of a bygone area significant to the development of Saline and our nation as a whole. And um, the actual farmstead was built in the 1840s by the Tate family and eventually was purchased by the Rentschler family in 1901. 
and the farmstead has a very rich and long history and has was really a part, as all of you know, with the whole um, campus south of Michigan Avenue with the Sock Trail Business Park was the farm, part of the farmstead. So um, <clears throat> through the partnership with the City of Saline Historical Society, the City of Saline has worked to ensure the survival of this historic site. So congratulations to all. The dedication, be recognizing, I think, the city government and the city council and the staff for the importance of this her the heritage and the way that we have been working together as a community, I think, is exemplary and everything that you do to show off this part of our history, I think is really um, a very impressive and unique and a lot, of, a lot of communities have not been able to preserve the amount of heritage that we do here with the one room schoolhouse and the other work. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So again, it should be noted that the Sling Community has benefited from the educational service provided by the Agricultural Museum House within their um, Rentschler Farm. So this is signed and um, I just wanted to, I'm not sure, should I? I'll the mayor, <laughs> and I just wanted to really say uh, it's really impressive, and I know that we've spent a lot of time in this community recognizing our heritage and um, the importance. And I think it's really, um, really important for our young people to understand that because we, you really don't have a perspective of where we were and where we came from without what you do and all the time you spent. So I really wanted to come and say thank you for all the volunteer hours because it takes a lot of time and work, and urge other people that are interested in preserving the heritage of Celine to get more involved in the historical society because I know you have several museums and you're doing tours and um, it's, a lot of, uh, it's a lot of fun, but we, you need a lot of manpower, so. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, well, let me, ju I'll just be very brief, my friends. I, I want to thank Representative Driscoll for taking time out of her schedule to, to join us this evening and to, to recognize this important uh, milestone and accomplishment. Um, and as this uh, tribute uh, rightfully says, Rensselaer Farm, or Rensselaer Farmstead, excuse me, is a symbol. It's not just a symbol of our history and our agricultural heritage, but I think it's a great symbol, a great icon to see when you enter the, the corporate limits of the city of Saline from the west. Um, and as the, the representative mentioned, it is a city-owned and municipally-owned park. Um, but it wouldn't be the icon it is today if it were not for all of you and all of your man hours, all of your financial resources, all of the passion you, you devote to the facility. Um, and I just want to say that it's greatly appreciated and, and keep up the good work. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Can I just say one Please. I, I forgot to mention uh, Warren and Marilyn Rentschler, who could not be here this evening. Without them, uh, this wouldn't happen. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Linda, do you want to come up here? Okay. We transition to something that's a little bit more bittersweet, but um, we're very excited for, for Linda and her family. Uh, um, so 26 years, is that right? 20. 20, excuse me. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so Linda retired actually last month, and we had a, a, a lovely party, a reception here um, three, four weeks ago. Um, here in council chambers, and many of you uh, were able to join us. Um, it is bittersweet because um, Linda is a tremendous public servant um, who contributed greatly to the success of, of the city of Saline. Um, and therefore, she's going to be greatly missed, but we wish you and your husband and all your extended family the best in all your future endeavors. You know, Linda had um, kind of a unique tenure here uh, with the city of Saline because she occupied three different positions. First, um, at the rec center, then as office manager for our DPW, and lastly as office manager for the police department. And I think that's indicative, I think that's a testament to her great skill, um, her ability, um, and just how, how prized and how valued she was as an employee. Um, and again, she contributed greatly to the overall structure um, and success of the city, but, but to each one of those departments uh, and entities individually. So I'm not going to read this um, letter of recognition, recognition, excuse me, Linda, in its entirety. Again, I just want to congratulate you on a job well done. Thank you for your years of service, and I wish you and your family nothing but the best in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah.
And as you know, we're short-staffed here, so if you ever want to come back and visit and put in a couple hours, uh, we would welcome that as well. Thank you for being here. <clears throat> okay, we move on to citizen comments on agenda items. Uh, under the Open Meetings Act, any citizen may come forward at this time and make comment or question on an item that appears on this agenda. Comments will be limited to three minutes per person. Anyone who would like to speak is requested, but not required to state his or her name and address for the record. Are there any citizen comments? Please. Okay. Well, why don't, well, I think that's appropriate. So I, and my apologies because I should have mentioned this to you before. I just wanted to let you know that um, I had a meeting with um, the MDOT team, which is a planner, the University Region Planner, and four other uh, MDOT folks to talk about different projects around other, my district. Uh, and I did mention to them about the four corners that had been asked by uh, staff to, because it took a while to get the payment markings, and I mentioned to them, she made a little, little cold, so I mentioned to them how quickly the payment markings came off and um, urged them in light of the fact that I highly doubt there's going to be additional funding, and also, uh, Mayor Marl, to your uh, point about requesting MDOT to consider uh, financing the um, US 12 between here and 94. Uh, currently, there, I'm, I sit on the Transportation Infrastructure Committee. I've been on there since January, and I don't really see any momentum to have any additional investment in transportation uh, in the short term. So I am urging uh, MDOT to look at the Four Corners uh, more seriously. I, I um, urge them to consider looking at the, talking to the city manager and uh, talk, um, looking at the, say, uh, the walkability studies and trying to find some other more reliable way to get across Michigan Avenue and address the four corners safety uh, for the mobility of non-motorized traffic so they can cross Michigan Avenue safely. I know that's a huge issue for this community and I mentioned the fact that uh, the Selene community is on the select Main Street and that it would be well worth their investment in light of the fact that the reconstruct that the community of Selene has been waiting for for many years along Michigan Avenue will not be happening anytime soon, my uh, regrets to say. But, you know, if we do get any more money this next term that I'm currently sitting in, it, w it, is, only, it is not for, you know, a reconstruction. It's actually for maintenance. And so I, um, I'm not, I would be surprised to see that we would actually get the reconstruct funded because there are bridges that are falling down around my district. Manchester's uh, bridge is actually almost not crossable at this point. They're very, it's, you know, very precarious. So I just wanted to report on that. I did urge them to reach out to uh, the city manager, Todd. I don't know if you've heard from them yet, but hopefully you will be getting, um, I met with them like two weeks ago and they were very interested in trying to do something at the Four Corners. So I just wanted to let you know. And please keep in touch with my office if you ever need anything. Thank you. It's an just honor serving you. Just real quick, and then there may be some questions because uh, <coughs> multiple times in the past couple weeks, um, members of council have brought up some pieces of legislation that they ever either had questions or concerns about. Um, as it relates to the um, MDOT issue that, um, that I emailed you about, it, as I stated in the email, um, you know, I had a conversation with my counterparts in Pittsfield Township, and uh, as you're well aware, the Michigan Ave corridor, which connects both municipalities, is of vital importance, strategic importance, not only to the region, but ultimately to the state. And we're under no, um, no illusion that anything is gonna be done in the, the, the finite. However, um, the issue is too important to simply restate the problem. Um, and so we wanted to drum up some public support and, and really verbalize um, what our complaints and what our, our, our concerns are and, and maybe begin a more constructive, uh, a more beneficial dialogue with some, some uh, MDOT officials. So anything you could do, excuse me, to help facilitate that, we can have a future conversation, would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, I think that the key, again, is currently uh, the one and a half billion dollars that they're looking for is not for any kind of road uh, expansion. It would be... Um, possibly some addressing of the downtown here, but really there are so many roads that are in very serious, um, uh, what we call poor condition, that 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 project, the fact that it would cause, you know, there would be land acquisition and a lot of other costs, I, it's gonna take uh, a different mindset. And I think that part of this is uh, importance that people really need to understand that the current funding of our roads is um, back where it was in 2001 due to the fact that we have a flat gas tax and miles per gallon is actually 
going up, which means our revenues are going down, and then also the value because the cost of materials continue to go up. So we're hugely out of balance right now, and we've actually been talking about this, as many of you heard from me in the past sitting in that chair, that this has been an issue since our representative Pam Burns, who I spoke with recently, had tried to come up with bipartisan legislation to address the shortfall in funding. So as soon as the voters recommend, recognize when they get polled that this is something that they want to invest in, I think something will happen, but currently, my observation is Lansing, they poll, and if people say they don't want to put money in their roads, it doesn't happen, and that's where we are right now. And it is, um, the problem, the biggest problem is the longer we wait to not put money in our roads, the more um, they fall apart, and it actually costs six times more than if we just maintain them without them cracking to the point where water gets below the roadbed. So that's where we're really getting into a crisis problem, and it's going to be put on our kids if we don't do something about it. I think, so I think we all share, and I certainly share your frustration. Yeah, I you just know. want to make sure that you guys know what right. I am working really hard to make sure whatever I can do locally. I have a couple of projects. You know, I'm, I'm also I met with. Um, village of Manchester, uh, and I'm going to be going to their next level meeting to try to get that because they're in their third year of applying for the critical bridge program, but it's a really big project. And then I, the other, I have a couple other communities that have big projects too. So I don't know, does anybody else have any other questions about any legislation that's pending? I know you mentioned the uh, local reinvestment, and I think I sent an email back, but about um, it's an economic earning program. It's pretty creative. So. Yeah, thank you for your Bill 4996. Response. Any other questions? Mr. Gearbo, did you want to reference the, uh, uh, we don't have the bill number, but I'm sure you're aware of it, um, regarding, uh, I'll, I'll turn over to Mr. Gearbo. The billing, the bill regarding uh, apartment apartment re inspections and everything that they're attempting to try and change at the state level so that the locals don't have as much um, enforcement. I'm actually it. not aware of it. I'm not sure what committee okay. it's in, but I'd be happy to find out more would, if you wouldn't it's mind. A, it's, I believe it's a Robertson bill out of the Senate, and um, your office should have received some communiques from MTA and MML okay. verbalizing some pretty strident opposition. Okay. And for good reason. Yeah, and one other question. Mezzanine funding? I don't know if you've heard anything right. about that and what that's yep. happening, because we talked about that at Main Street recently. So, Well, I, we've worked with, I'm on the Commerce Committee, and we worked with uh, MEDC, Excuse me, Mishta on getting some mezzanine funding as part of their uh, expanding their bond, bonding program, and they said they were committed to doing that. I know the MEDC is developing a program for that too, so both of those um, departments have focus on that um, issue as being a, one of those challenges that we have in their state that, I don't know if it's unique anymore, but and we've had that issue a lot longer than a lot of other states because of our two recessions, the state recession, the national recession has impacted, I think, Michigan a little bit more heavily than other states. So they're certainly very aware of it, and so th those, there are some programs that are going on there. Great. Thank you. Sure. Anything else? <coughs> Thank you for Thank you. Um, giving me an opportunity to speak before at the end. Thank you. Yep. Have a good evening. Are there any additional citizen comments on agenda items? No, then we move on to the consent agenda. The following consent agenda will normally be adopted without discussion. However, at the request of any citizen or council member, any item may be removed from the consent agenda for council discussion. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as amended? So move. Moved by Roth. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Tahar. Hearing no discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ayes have it. The motion carries unanimously. We move on to new business, item 13-163. This is IFT application form evaluation. This will be a motion to acknowledge the memo dated October 16th, 2013 from Business Ambassador Kathy Corfman and to approve or not to approve the changes to the IFT evaluation guidelines subject to review and approval of legal counsel. Is there a motion? Is there a motion? I'll move to acknowledge receipt. Okay, it's been moved by Gearbot to acknowledge receipt. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Peters. Ms. Corpin, would you like to come up and discuss your memorandum? The Special Projects Commission met um, earlier this month and we made numerous changes to the current IFT evaluation guideline. One of the things that we did was split it between real and personal, whereas before that was a combined guideline. Um, under the real IFT evaluation guideline, the job points were reduced and reallocated to the special merit section. Intensity of investments removed um, the word land and replaced with site improvements to broaden the scope of the investment. Um, this could be a new business or a current business that is upgrading or expanding their business. 
Air pollution we eliminated. Um, permits for air emission are issued and monitored by the state, and it was determined that this section should be removed. Wastewater quality, we removed this section as well. In the past, we awarded points on a sliding scale, and the commission didn't feel we should be awarding points um, for something that the company should already be in compliance with. And no points should be given if they weren't in compliance, which was not the case previously. If they were a little under scale, we still gave them points down to zero, and they felt that we shouldn't be giving them anything if they weren't where they should be. Special merit points, uh, we added the words time and community to recognize communities that have been in the community for several years, or companies, excuse me. Um, special merit, optional determination of length. We removed the words match state incentives since we haven't had an IFT involving state incentives in a long time. It also allowed for the commission to give additional merit points if they deem appropriate without being restricted by the previous wording. Points were capped at 12 years for the real, which is not anything different. Um, the point scale was adjusted to reflect the point changes. The personal um, IFT evaluation guideline, previous points mentioned are the same with the exception of item number five, which addressed new building only. That doesn't apply to the personal property, so it was removed. Um, item number six, which was new business to Celine or over 10 million or expanded facility only. We reworded that so it applied to personal property. The years on this one were capped at six years. The commission felt that due to the depreciation life of equipment that we should not be going 12 years on those abatements. Um, and the point scales were adjusted to reflect the changes. Basically the point scale on the personal side is half the points of the real property in order to get in alignment with a six-year abatement. Thank you, Mr. Korfman. Are there any questions? Start with questions. Mr. Burgoyne. Um, the, uh, you stated that uh, land improvements was replaced with site improvements to make it broader. But land improvements actually is broader than site, site improvements. Uh, improvements on land include building, site improvements, and everything else. So um, by moving to site improvements, you eliminated uh, structures on the land. So perhaps the wording, if you didn't like, uh, if the, the uh, committee did not like land improvements, they could word it differently, improvements on the land. It, that was meant to include buildings and site improvements. So by moving to only site improvements, you're limiting, not broadening. The item before only said land. It didn't say land improvements. So they wanted to say site improvements oh, it, to it, broaden. It just said land and not land yes, improvements? Yes, only land. That's correct. Yeah. Oh. Mr. Rose. I was just going to comment on that. Please. That definition that we expanded to in this one was based on Ms. Skull's recommendation based on what, um, how they look at it for the tax abatement process. So we took this from her consideration when she said that we should change it to site improvements. Thank you, Mr. Gearbox. Mr. Rose. Um, I applaud the efforts of the Special Projects Commission. I think this is moving in the, in the right direction. I do have two comments. One is I still have this concern about applying a multiplier of $50,000 of investment to a job. I don't think there's any real relationship, fixed relationship between a $50,000 investment and a job. I, I think that we should recognize the creation of new jobs, but I think it ought to be whatever the number of jobs is that these folks anticipate in putting in place and not being an automatic calculation. And that applies to both real and personal property. And then on the real property, um, I, I'm not seeing where the Environmental Commission's request to uh, recognize construction to lead standards is included. When we had the lead representative out to the Special Projects Commission, it was requested by an Environmental Commission member that they come speak with them. So we waited to see if they were going to make a recommendation back to us before we did anything with the lead. 
Yeah, well, that information did not get to the Environmental Commission, so I would, um, I, I don't want to be changing these guidelines on a regular basis here, so I'd like to suggest that we hold off on taking any action on this then until the Environmental Commission can, in fact, come back. When's their next meeting, Mr. Rhodes? Uh, it's um, later in November. We just had one. Well, you look so at November 20. November 20. Um, Mr. Corfman, we don't um, we don't anticipate anybody. No, we're past the deadline, aren't we? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you, Mr. Rhodes. Appreciate your comments. Okay. Additional comments, questions for Ms. Corfman? Mr. Gearball? I was just going to make comments. Um, the commission really looked at this from the perspective of trying to determine what's fair and reasonable. We looked at different communities comparing to theirs, trying to understand from a perspective of how other communities are actually addressing this concern and how they're actually handling it. Um, I think one of the bigger concerns that was brought up to me and uh, the commission was the understanding of when we award these is really doing the additional follow-up to make sure that the investment was actually put in place and that what we're granting is sufficient for what the number of years and everything that they've been awarded. There are some concerns that when we look at how it balances out and how the number of years and how the actual um, construction occurs, that we haven't really been so proactive in making sure that every dollar has been spent and, uh, and, and so forth. So I think that was one of the procedures that we want to see put in place. And I think um, Ms. Skull had a good idea of how we should handle that. And I would like to consider that be part of whatever we move forward on this as we try to do these things. It really has been an issue of the um, checks and balances on this because I think we've always had the concern with the jobs and I agree with um, Council Member Rhodes about um, awarding for positions because what we've had in the past we've had concerns where um, we've guaranteed some of this based on jobs and yet as a re result of a cre uh, the recession or such the number of jobs could go away and so at that point we would basically say well no your abatement isn't appropriate so we should have taken it back. We've never really looked at it from that perspective because we don't want to penalize a company that is really trying to move forward when it's being um, impacted by the recession or whatever that's happening in the economy. Um, and I think that was one of the things, the reason why we took this down to the number of points that we did. We basically cut it in half, I think yes, we, did. we did. Yeah. So, um, and I agree with that. So that concern is always something we might want to look at in the future depending on how it is. But really it is that aspect that I can believe is addressing things to recognize for what really is consistent with what companies should be doing as being a good citizen and what we really want to encourage. And a lot of this is encouraging new jobs to help diversify what we have in the community and to look at other aspects that maybe benefit us as more investment or new trends towards companies that are coming online so that we have them as part of our overall um, portfolio. Thank you, Mr. Gearball. Let me, let me just echo some of the things my, my colleague just articulated. Uh, as he mentioned earlier, um, the process of revising our IFT evaluation guidelines was, um, was quite thorough, as I think Mr. Gearball and many of um, the Special Projects Commission can attest. Um, there were some pretty substantive discussions. Um, as um, has been indicated by both Mr. Rhodes and Mr. Gearbaugh, there's a lot of good changes in here. We've always had a good system, a good policy in place, but I think we've made it um, substantially better. Um, in understanding um, Mr. Rhodes' concerns, not only about some um, environmental issues, but also about the um, jobs portion, I don't have any problem unless anyone objects to wordsmithing that a little bit and then waiting to, to receive a formal recommendation from the Environmental Commission. Um, and then it looks like we'd probably bring this back at probably our first meeting in December would be my guess. That'd be fine. Thank you. Yep. That'd be fine. Okay. No one objects to that? Mr. Burgoyne? Uh, I have a follow-up question. Okay. Let me get consensus on my question first. Mr. Gearball, you have no problem nope, bringing this back? Okay. Mr. Roth? No problem. Okay. Mr. Tahar? No problem. Mr. Peters? That's fine. Okay. Okay. Mr. Burgoyne? You're fine with that? Yes. Okay. Please proceed with your question. Um, under item two, um, is land no longer being considered in the total? Right. We removed that word and said site improvements instead. So the total cost does not include the cost of the land. Because my suggestion would be to leave the word land in there and just insert land including site improvements. And so you'd get both the cost and whatever they've improved. Uh, otherwise, you're losing the cost of the land. I think it's my understanding a site is all inclusive. Yes. Site includes the land, yeah. uh, the structures, 
utilities, everything on board. That's something you would agree with? A site, the definition of site? Is, it, well, it's not site, it's site improvements that they, they insert. Yeah, why, why, don't we, uh, why don't we do this after conferring with the city manager? Because we're looking at, um, well, we'll be receiving um, a recommendation from the Environmental Commission because we still want to maybe wordsmith the job section. And now, considering Mr. Burgoyne's concerns about the use of the word land or site, maybe it would be best that all of these things be reconsidered. We call it a an additional meeting of the Special Projects Commission after we receive that uh, analysis and recommendation from the Environmental Commission. Okay. Have them take one more look at this and then discharge it to, to Council. And I think, again, we can probably meet that, that deadline of, of receiving it at our first, if not our second meeting in December. Okay? All right. All right? Good. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Corpin. We appreciate your work on this very much. Okay? If there's nothing further, there's a motion on the floor to acknowledge receipt, moved by Gearboss, seconded by Peters. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ayes have it and the motion carries unanimously. We move on to new business item 13-164. This is water sewer rate study. This will be a motion to approve or not approve the, propo the proposal from Tetratech to complete an MDEQ sewer use charge system and water rate study at a cost of $19,900 and to authorize or not authorize the city manager to sign acceptance of the October 15, 2013 written proposal. Move to Move approve to and approve. authorize. Okay, it's been moved by Gearbot to approve and authorize. Is there a second? Support. Support by Mr. Rhodes. i turn it over to our guests from uh, Tetratech, if you'd like to come up with Mr. Rubel as well. Discuss this matter. We appreciate you being here this evening, gentlemen. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as you recall, in December of last year, we did uh, have, a, have an approval for a sewer and rate study because we, we thought we had proceeded at the time we were going to design and and plan the project and then consider the funding of it and the reimbursement of the funds eventually. Uh, but then in January, that was deferred until this fall when we would take the action proposed tonight. And uh, <clears throat> there, you know, there, there, is some, there, there, there were some benefits of doing that. And I just want to list uh, some, of, some of the major ones. Uh, one that it allowed us to finish the planning uh, and the funding consideration and the taking of bids for, for, for phase one, so now we know what those costs are. Uh, we were able to complete the process of obtaining the S2 grant and therefore the 90% funding of a majority of the plan uh, design engineering as well as construction engineering. And as you see in the memorandum tonight, 90% uh, funding of the sewer rate portion. And then uh, it also uh, uh, gave us uh, the ability to draft the project plan in accordance with the S2 guidelines that led us into a better handling or, or you know, a concept of what's in phase two of the uh, wastewater plant improvements. And so uh, with that in hand, we also knew that the conducting of a water and sewer rate study would run uh, concurrently with both the new SAW grant opportunity, which is the asset management program, as well as developing a more accurate and useful capital improvement plan. So now all three of those will work together and they sort of reinforce each other and will give us a better yield on that type of information. So I will turn it over to uh, uh, Brian uh, Rubel, who is the uh, head of operations there at Tetratech, and Vic Cooperwasser, who actually drafted, I think, the last two or three water and sewer rate studies for the city of Saline. Thank you, gentlemen. Well, good evening, uh, council members and mayor. Uh, I'm going to be very brief. Uh, we explained, I think, the scope pretty well in the proposal. Uh, Mr. Robel also explained the background very well. Uh, but the city of Salina, their water and sewer uh, utilities incur about $5 million a year in costs. And therefore, you know, rate studies are, are helpful to make sure that you are capturing the appropriate revenue to pay for those costs. Uh, the city received about $130,000 in S2 grant funds over the last year, and $15,000 of that was reserved to do what they call a user charge system. And a user charge system is, is just a different name for a sewer rate study, and it needs to be packaged and presented differently to the DEQ uh, versus what would be convenient for city staff and the council to have. So. We, the analysis is very similar, but then we would package it for the state one way and then for you and, and the citizens of Saline a little different way. 
that grant expires in January, so you have just a few months left to complete uh, the uh, user charge system and, and get reimbursed through the grant for, for that. Uh, so we broke in our proposal out a cost specifically for the user charge system. Um, we also presented a cost to do a water rate study at the same time. Uh, there are some fixed costs that go into uh, preparing a rate study, and there is some efficiency if you were to do both at one time. If you had to repeat the water study in a year or two, it would be more expensive than it would be today. Uh, when we developed the proposal, the staff did ask that uh, they had a desire to update the rates or at least look at different scenarios of projects and, and what the impact on the rates would be. Uh, within, a, within the five-year period that you've done before. So we uh, added some scope items to deliver to the staff the spreadsheets that we use and provide some training and, and a manual of how to use the spreadsheets. So that would be a tool for the staff to use um, in between having a consultant help you. And, uh, you know, we've, we've had the good fortune of assisting Celine with rate studies for 10-plus years. And... Uh, we were actually able to keep the fee relatively the same uh, this cycle as we did last cycle, and that's due to, to Vic's uh, familiarity with your system and, and so forth. So uh, obviously we were very pleased and, uh, to provide that proposal, and uh, Vic in particular uh, is really a, a state expert and a regional expert, kind of a Great Lakes expert on race studies, so he'd be the one doing most of the work, and we could take uh, questions. There are questions? Mr. Burgoyne? Um, as you know, we do not have the um, updated levels for water and sewer reserves. Our sewer reserve uh, amount was set in 1987 when we had a federal grant, and the water reserve amount um, is very low. So in order to do an updated rate study, um, last time we did not update the water and sewer reserves because water uh, consumption rates needed to go up so much because uh, we had a shortfall on our, uh, on the proceeds for on the water side. Uh, but we do have to have the proper updated sewer and water reserve amounts. We have about $44 million worth of capital and of that, about one-third has been depreciated. Um, of course, when something is depreciated, it doesn't necessarily have to be replaced. It's just depreciated that far. But when you have $15 million worth of depreciation, that implies that there's, at some point, there's going to be some replacement needs. And the replacement reserve should be in today's dollars, not in 1987 dollars. And in 1987, there wasn't a water treatment plant, and we didn't have as much investment on the water side. So in order to do the rate study properly, we need, a prop, need proper numbers for the reserve, both on the water side and Mr. the Mr. Burgoyne, do you have a question? Yes. So my, my, my question is, um, how is, is the updated number, how are we going to have an updated number, how is that going to be used in the rate study? Yeah, I think so. Uh, as given in our proposal on the first page, um, one of the items that we will review, consider, and incorporate in the rate study is targeted cash reserves. And I believe uh, that's the area that you're discussing and that's a standard operating procedure when we do rate studies so as part of doing the work we'll be discussing with with staff uh, these cash reserves and uh, and and uh, they're just one part of the whole picture they're you know uh, and that'll be incorporated in the study and and the reserve amount if there's a change our council and our staff will change the code to whatever's up the updated numbers should be. I so that'll come out of the, the study. I can't speak to that in terms of what the res result will be or anything. Okay. Additional questions? Mr. Gearbaugh? This may be more for Mr. Campbell, not necessarily you. So if we've had previous um, 
reviews like this, have we addressed our cash reserves at those times? Since if we would have done this with you guys the last two times, I'm thinking this is consistent with what we've done in the past. Why would we have not um, addressed those reserves at that time? Well, I think part of it was um, trying to smooth, if you will, I guess. Um, let, me, let me back up. The last couple uh, rate studies we've seen where one utility was stronger than the other and to keep from having an overall large increase. Mm -hmm. So uh, water, um, I don't remember now. We basically Wa water, water was stronger than, than sewer. And so the sewer rates went up the first couple years. And actually the, the, um, uh, the water rates went down. Got it. Um, and so there was back and forth kind of these big swings where one gets one gets weaker and one gets stronger. Mm -hmm. And so my hope for this next one is that we're going to even out so we can continue on that they're both strong as opposed to one gets weaker and one gets stronger. Uh, now that that certainly may reflect um, a bigger bump to rate users. So in the past, the concern was just that to try and lessen that, which is reasonable. Um, but again, this through this study, the hope is to see where we would be at to, to uh, get them both strong and keep them strong. Okay, so we have been doing that, so addressing the reserves in the past. Got it. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Gearball. Are there additional questions? Questions, Mr. Regoyne? Yeah, uh, no, a uh, comment. Well, let me Act finish up with questions first. I want to make sure no one else on council has any questions for our guests. Are there any additional questions? No? Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Thank Mr. You. Burgoyne, your comments? Um, the comment is that we did not change the reserve last time because water need, needed to go up so much. Water was, the water fund was very, very cash poor. So uh, right now, if you see in the audit, uh, the water has, is very, very strong and the sewer side is reasonably strong. But um, we did not change the reserves for the reason that Mr. Campbell said, which is that we needed the rates to go up and changing the reserve at the same time would have made it an enormous rate increase and we needed it to be smooth. So we, we really kicked the can down the road a little bit last time. Any additional discussion regarding this motion? Mr. Roth? I'd just like to make a comment. I think that the reason the water was out of balance is because of the construction of the filtration plant, osmosis and so on, that ate up some of the reserves. And the same thing with, with when we start to we use the money to work at the sewage plant, it's going to take that reserve down. So it's a yo-yo effect rather than just a consumption and so on. So that's, that's my observation of what has been going on and how it works. Any additional discussion regarding this motion? Ms. Tahar. Yes, um, I would just like to comment. I, I very much appreciate this approach in um, combining the studies to get the most efficiency from, from and cost benefit from, from our expenditures and from the effort. Um, and also the aspect of uh, looking forward and planning forward um, so that, that we have a better idea of what's coming on down the road. So thank you very much for those. Additional comments? No? Then it's been properly moved by Gearboss, seconded by Rhodes to approve and authorize. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ayes have it. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you again, gentlemen. We move on to new business item 13-165. This is the Celine Main Street Design Team logo request. This will be a motion to acknowledge the memo dated October 15th, 2013 from Cindy Zhubko and to approve or not approve the request to utilize the Celine logo. Is there a motion? Move to approve. Moved by Rhodes to approve. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mayor Pro Tem Tahar. Ms. Zhubko. Thank you for being here. Hi, I'm Cindy Tupco. I'm representing actually the CQC Promote Celine Committee. So Celine Main Street is part of this committee, but I am representing CQC. And come on up here. Um, this is Jennifer Weaver from Gen Motion Marketing, which is the firm that we hired through this effort um, to do and work with us on this Promote Celine effort. Some time ago, 
the city um, invited representatives from several organizations throughout the Selene community to come together in this room to talk about challenges, um, what each of the organizations were actually doing in the organization so we could all learn from each other, and then also um, how could we collaborate together. After that meeting, I know several things happened, but one of them was that some of the representatives from those organizations got together because we heard overwhelmingly that a lot of the challenge of, of all of our organizations is marketing and promoting our community and our individual organizations, and how do we do that effectively? So we started meeting almost a year ago. Actually, it was probably over a year ago by now. Um, and we started trying to figure out what is the best way to do this. We decided to pool our resources, um, come under the guise of CQC, and hire a consultant to help us build a toolkit that we could share with all of the organizations so that we could promote Celine in a unified message and also use it to strengthen each of the individual organizations and businesses in our community. So this toolkit is ready to go. We're ready to launch it, and we're going to launch it at a meeting on November 14th from um, 3 to 5 at the library, Brecken Room. And we're very excited about it because it's been a very long effort. We held a, a public meeting and, and put a lot of brains together to figure out which direction we, excuse me, needed to go in. So this toolkit is ready. Um, and like I said, we're going to get it launched very soon. And then it will be housed on the CQC website, which is brand new. And it will be there for everyone to be able to use. There will be instructions on how to use it. At the launch meeting, we're also going to give instructions on how to use this toolkit. And it's really going to be used to strengthen our community as a whole, not just the city, but the Saline area. So we're pretty excited about it. Um, Jen is going to talk to you about why um, we're here and the requests that we have for using a piece of some of the branding that was done in the past. Because um, one of the reasons is for, for that is that this was not a branding effort. We didn't have the dollars or the resources or the time in order to do a community-wide branding effort. So this is an alternative to that effort. That's all right. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, good evening, Mayor Marl and City Council members, and Mr. Campbell, thank you for your time this evening. Uh, as Cindy mentioned, the, the toolkit elements, the tools, if you will, are ready to go. Um, however, the toolbox, the, the, if you can imagine the tool toolkit and toolbox as the brand, um, is what we here, are here to t discuss with you this evening. Um, as Cindy mentioned, we were here, I think, back in June, June 17th at a meeting to discuss the, the possibility or opportunity to uh, utilize one of the existing kind of brand elements in Celine, the B Celine site. Uh, we since had received some um, feedback from other community members that perhaps that wasn't um, a direction that everyone was comfortable with. And so we took a step back, again, just kind of completed the task of, of um, developing the toolkit materials. But in order to um, achieve the second part of our mission, which is to give a, a unified look and message to these elements so that the various organizations and businesses in Celine can use them to speak with a unified voice and not with um, you know, many mixed messages. Um, we wanted to and, and really need to uh, give it at least some kind of a, a logo or look and feel to, to bring these elements together. Um, so what we are requesting basically is to utilize a small element of something that people would recognize off of the B. Celine site, and that is, uh, I believe you should have received a memo, if not I have some additional copies, um, the actual logo font, um, the Nutritext family of fonts that was used first in that B. Celine campaign, um, along with the recognizable kind of dot pattern that, that folks have gotten used to seeing. We are suggesting, however, that we update the color palette a little bit on those dots um, to be more reflective of the other various Celine websites and organizations that people are accustomed to seeing. So the city website, the Celine Area Schools website, the chamber website, um, kind of all of those colors are represented in the, the updated palette that we're suggesting. Um, so our request for you really is to um, approve the use of these logo elements just basically as headers, if you will, kind of a, a template. Um, or letterhead, if you would, for these various 
pardon me, toolkit materials, um, just to give them a, a look and feel of consistency um, until such time as we may be able to revisit a larger branding effort for the community of Celine. We also thought that by using this element, it would tie the other branding efforts in with everything else. So, for example, at Celine Main Street, if we're going to use one of our fact sheets, we probably have our Celine Main Street logo on it, but we would also include the Celine logo. So that, and we would teach the other organizations that this would help tie the whole community together. Mm -hmm. That's why we're. Mm -hmm. And we should mention too that the, the way that this logo is envisioned to be used in addition to a, a header, if you will, on the various toolkit elements, um, we've also proposed um, kind of a button look for it, if you will, and the, the button would be housed on the various uh, Selene websites as well as the new CQC website, and that's basically your, your link to the toolkit elements online. Um, so we're seeking permission not just to have it available once you download and print something, but also to live electronically on these various websites. Um, the Promote Celine Committee has also been invited by the Chamber to include a page in the upcoming Chamber directory, um, just listing this as a new community resource. So not an advertisement by any means, but just here is a resource that's available to you, Chamber members, community members, um, a new marketing toolkit for you. So it would also appear in that that region. Terrific. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there any questions? Mr. Roth. Uh, it's in regard to this particular page, you, you're allowing the users to have options, this with a background, without a background. Why, why not eliminate some of that so it'll tr truly look, this looks completely different from that. Well, so we, why not, why take, a, I would suggest taking away some of the options. Mm -hmm. So we'd be much more uniform. To tell you the truth, I like the options because right now Celine Main Street is looking at doing a folder to, um, and we're going to have the city logo on the back of it, the Main Street logo and the chamber, so it's a collaborative thing, but that folder will house all of the attraction materials, but the folder is navy blue, so the other logo would not work on it. We need something that would be reversed to show on the navy blue instead of having just a plain Folder. So sometimes you need a reverse element for your logo so that you can be a little more versatile. And, and to further that point, that is fairly common practice in typical marketing and branding efforts that usually not only do you have a, a white as well as a reversed out option um, and a colored option, but often you also have a black and white option for, you know, <coughs> when you're not using color in your printed application. So this still uses the same fonts, the same color palette, but it, it allows for some degree of customization depending upon the particular project or organization's needs. Mr. Peters? Just real quick, what was the uh, date and time of that rollout again of the toolbox? November 14th. At? 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. at the Liberty Breakfast. Thank you. Library program. Library. Ah. <laughs> Library. Library. Library, okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Mr. Gearbaugh? Just real quick, is that tagline the same one we had when we did B uh, Celine or is this new? The, this the tagline is, is new. This is, is kind of a, a hybrid, a bridge, if you will. So the, the tagline previously under the B Celine campaign was be here, basically. Right. Um, some of the feedback that we had gotten actually after the meeting that we held with you and also after the focus group meeting that we held in May um, with various members of the community was that there was some sensitivity to that Be Here campaign. It caused some confusion um, for some people and um, felt pretty strongly that they didn't, didn't feel they wanted to see that carry forward. So the It's Good to Be Here line is um, kind of a bridge, if you will. It, it softens that, that a little bit. Um, but could lead to you know, future branding considerations um, while still having a degree of familiarity with, with a campaign that's already in existence. Okay. No, I just was trying to recall for myself, but actually I was thinking it's great to be here, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know, we, we can always uh, add a little hyperbole to that too. We would agree with that. Good. Any other questions? Please. I'm wondering if we ought to have just a terms of use that goes with this. Um, so that we make sure that there may be some types of businesses that we would prefer not using this logo with. Okay. Huh. Good point. Yeah. And one other <laughs> clarification, do we have to go back to our original 
agreement that we had with the company that came up with the B saline to make sure we don't have any issues? Uh, I don't believe so, no. Okay. Um, and you've made a very good point because the committee itself wants to come up with terms of use for the brand for the promote saline toolkit, too. So we have the same um, concerns. So we could dovetail those efforts together, and I don't think it. It, it could be just a simple few sentences. It doesn't have to be very long. Okay. Yeah, very good. Good suggestion. Thank you, Scott. And this, um, just one additional note, this would be kind of a part of a little bit larger style guide that would also include the actual font files, the um, PMS colors for the, the color palette itself. Um, so it would be, that would also accompany the, the greater use um, guidelines on how, when, and where to use this appropriately. Okay. Additional questions, comments? Mr. Roth? The question far as what if somebody wants to print a simple black and white copy, no colors, other, how is this going to work with it? Is it going to be granted or not? So as you give your PMS and all the rest of this mm -hmm. stuff, pretty much insisting that they're restricted to using it for color purposes only. Um, as, as we discussed before, we'd be glad to include a black and white option uh, as part of the style site sheet. Yes, we're, we're planning to do that anyhow. So it's a, it's a pretty common practice to offer that as an additional option. Anything else? Well, ladies, I want to thank you for being here tonight. Um, and I appreciate um, being able to take the first step in a very important process. Um, you know, you, you spent some time with us and, and described uh, in detail the process, I think, earlier this summer. Um, and I've long complained about the lack of cohesion and consistency, not only in themes and images, but also in narratives. Um, and I'm not an expert in marketing, but one thing I do know is that um, a flawed message theme or visual is always better than an inconsistent one. Mm -hmm. So it looks like we're taking an important step in, in the right direction. So thank you for your work. Thank you very much. Okay. Is there any further discussion? No, then it's been properly moved by Rhodes, seconded by Tahar to approve. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ayes have it and the motion carries unanimously. Thank you, ladies. We, we move on to new business item 13-166. This is city attorney contract. This will be a series of two motions. The first of which is to approve or not to approve. The general legal services contract between the City of Saline and Dickinson Wright PLLC and to authorize or not authorize the mayor and city clerk to sign the contract. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, very briefly, and then I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Smith. Um, was contacted by Roger Sweats. You may recall Roger is one of the, the original team members uh, from Clark Hill um, that um, Scott and, and he would be changing from Clark Hill to um, Dickinson Wright, uh, another very um, prominent uh, uh, law firm uh, with a very strong municipal um, uh, service uh, to its clients. Um, so as, as we talked, um, um, I, I think it's, it's more of the team that, that we've been working with specifically from Clark Hill. And so we talked about uh, the possibilities, and um, uh, as we've seen, the possibilities are um, we could remain with Clark Hill, we could um, change uh, uh, and go as we're proposing um, with uh, Scott and, and Roger with, um, with to Dickinson Wright, except for the, the uh, labor piece, um, or we could go in a totally different direction. So um, staff is certainly uh, recommending that um, uh, we would go with the team, with uh, Scott and Roger, and then of course carving out that piece for the labor attorney with uh, Steve Gerard, who was on the original, one of the other original members of the, um, uh, uh, the original Clark Hill team. So with that, if there's any questions or comments, I will turn over to, um, to uh, Mr. Smith. I guess I'll answer any questions anybody has. I sent you a memo, I think, that mm -hmm. described uh, the, the move and the change. Uh, Dickinson Wright is a firm that probably has a stronger municipal practice. Um, one delight for me is, is getting back to working with Dick Went, who a couple of years ago was municipal attorney of the year. Uh, Dick 
um, and I practiced together for about 15 years at the beginning of my career, and he's just an outstanding municipal attorney, and I'm, I'm happy to be back with him and the whole team at, at Dickinson. Are there any questions for Mr. Smith? No? Okay. Okay, I didn't actually call a motion on this. My apologies. So um, we're going to transition then to uh, to the actual motion, unless there are questions for, for Mr. Smith. My apologies. The, again, the first motion will be a motion to approve or not to approve the general legal services contract between the City of Saline and Dickinson Wright PLCC and to authorize or not authorize the mayor and city clerk to sign the contract. Is there a motion? Move to approve and authorize. It's been moved by Mayor Pro Tem to Hart to approve and authorize. Is there a second? I'll second. Seconded by Mr. Peters. Discussion. Ms. Tahar. Um, yes, I'm in support of this, um, this change. I believe we went through a very thorough um, and good search process um, when we changed city attorney um, and that the decision was based on the team, not necessarily on the law firm as a whole. So staying and, and also based on um, the performance we've seen so far this year with our legal team, um, I believe that this is the correct move. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Mr. Roth? I was wondering what the financial implications are. Is it going to cost more? Um, uh, they're, gonna, they're, the same, they're mirroring the same terms of the uh, current contract, current agreement. And then uh, we're going to, um, at six months, um, we're going to reevaluate, and that actually gives us, you may recall from the, the, the current contract that's in place, uh, we would be doing that in December uh, of this year. So we're actually getting a, f a few more months uh, before we do review. So the hope is, and the intent uh, when we put that in there was that after a year, hopefully we could refine enough uh, of the systems that we could maybe even save some dollars. That's not guaranteed, but that was part of the intent to, uh, to look at that. So, um, so currently, it, it, it is a mere image of the existing contract. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roth. Mr. Rhodes, you had a comment? I, I did, but it may have been uh, answered because it related to the same question that Mr. Roth had asked. But I, I wanted to know if the annual fee, as stated in the contracts, is in excess of what the annual fee would have been if we had stayed with just the one firm. Mm -hmm. Um, it sure. remains the same. Okay. Thank you. Additional comments? Well, let me just say um, to echo uh, some of the sentiments of Mayor Pro Tem, um, Linda Tahar, I, I, I couldn't be more enthusiastic about this motion, and quite frankly, I couldn't be more delighted with um, the level of service we've received specifically from Scott and from Roger. Um, and as um, has been previously articulated this evening, I think what's more important than the law firm we associate with is the um, two lead counsels that we develop a relationship with. And much like Clark Hill, Dickinson Wright has a, a sterling reputation, um, a very well-regarded um, municipal practice, um, and evidently, I believe, a larger footprint than Clark Hill in terms of the number of attorneys that it has on staff. It has 350 attorneys, Clark Hill about 300. Okay. And uh, additionally, which may prove beneficial to the city, is unlike Clark Hill, they actually have a regional office in Ann Arbor, which I think could be helpful for uh, the prosecution of misdemeanor cases. Um, so I think the city has been very well served by Scott and Roger. I hope it's a relationship we're able to maintain for many, many years to come. Um, and again, I enthusiastically endorse this motion and the subsequent motion um, to retain um, Steve Gerard as our legal, legal counsel. Um, he has, as I indicated um, during the, the hiring of, of Steve, he has a, a regional um, reputation for excellence. Um, and um, as you all are aware, he did a really outstanding job um, negotiating contracts with our police officers union and with our sergeants association. So again, um, very much in favor of these two motions and urge a yes vote from my colleagues. Additional discussion? Just one question real quick. Mr. Gearbaugh. Um, how are we handling the contract with Clark Hill in terms of how to, do we have to renegotiate that? Is, is the result of continuing to have just one attorney and different services? Or I know that the contract has, has out clauses, but I just wasn't sure how we have to handle that moving forward. Right. If um, we do have a letter, or I received a letter uh, addressed to me, uh, reference 
the choices um, that I that outlined earlier. So, um, if if councils um, when they consider this, if their if their decision is to go with the team and Dickinson Wright, um, then we will um, complete the um, the document that, that shows the specifics, and we'll send that in, and, and everything will be complete that way because of, as you mentioned, because of the termination clauses that are there. And then we will, again, as the second motion um, addresses the uh, the agreement with um, Steve Gerard for Labor Council. Okay, I just wanted to clarify for the audience. <coughs> Council member, there's, there's a very amicable working relationship and will continue to be. Great. Additional comments? No? Okay, then we'll proceed to vote. It's been moved by Tahar, seconded by Peters to approve and authorize. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ayes have it, the motion carries unanimously. Moving on to the subsequent motion. This will be a motion to approve or not to approve the labor and employment legal service contract between the city of Saline and Clark Hill PLC and to authorize or not authorize the mayor and city clerk to sign the contract. Your motion. Move to approve and authorize. And moved by second. Rhodes to approve and authorize. Is there a second? Seconded by Burgoyne. I apologize, Mr. Burgoyne. Any discussion? Mr. Roth. It's my hope that the fees charged in this will be same as before, so we're not incurring any additional expense by having two firms. Uh, that is our that is staff's um, uh, wish as well. That's our desire, and that but that's if if it's over that, I think we should have some consideration, kind of as this motion reads, before you guys just go right ahead and do it. Well, just like with the the current agreement, there are uh, uh, again termination where we can simply, for cause or no cause, uh, end uh, end the um, relationship. Either con contract can be terminated at any time for any reason. You're paying a monthly retainer now. This takes that same monthly retainer and divides it into two pieces: one for the labor work and one for the general work. And so it's it's the same amount, um, just divided into two pieces. Thank you, Mr. Roth. Additional questions or comments? No. Then it's been properly moved by Rhodes, seconded by Burgoyne, to approve and authorize. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. <laughs> Ayes have it, and the motion carries unanimously. Thank you all. Move on now to uh, new business item 13-167. This is proposed amendments to the fire department, or proposed amendments, fire department public hearing, excuse me. This will be a motion to acknowledge and, and to approve or not to approve uh, receipt of an amendment to the Saline Area Fire Department Agreement as submitted by attorney Jesse O. Jack regarding revisions to section 6A, Saline Area Fire Board. Is there a motion? Move to approve receipt. Okay, it's been moved by Peters to approve. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Rhodes. Discussion. I'll just be very brief because uh, not only am I a member of the, the fire board, but also um, have the distinction and honor at the moment of serving as chair. So the revisions which um, are required to be approved by all the participating bodies, which would include City of Saline, Lodi Township, York Township, and Saline Township, are mainly housekeeping things um, related to the at-large position on our fire board, which, as you may recall, is um, going to be vacated by the current member by the end of this calendar year. And therefore, we're in the process of soliciting applications. And um, in November, as the document states, we'll be reviewing those applications and appointing someone to that at-large position. That our at-large position is key. It's, uh, there's a requirement that the person be independent and objective and not directly affiliated, affiliated excuse me, with one of the governing boards. And the reason why we have that alternate is because each of the participating municipalities are represented by two members of their legislative uh, boards. So in the event that there were, were to be a tie, this, uh, this position, which was created about 10 years ago, um, prevents uh, that predicament from, from occurring. Any questions? No? Okay. It's been properly moved by Peters, seconded by Rhodes to approve. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ayes have it. The motion carries unanimously. 
Move on to our last new business item, which is item 13-168, audit report from Plant Moran for fiscal year that ended June 30th, 2013. Is there a motion to, uh, excuse me, motion to acknowledge receipt of the audit report from Plant Moran for fiscal year ending June 30th, 2013, that was presented at the October 7th, 2013 council meeting. Motion to um, move to acknowledge receipt. Okay, it's moved by Burgoyne to acknowledge receipt. Is there a second? Second. Sarebaugh? Mr. Gearbaugh is the second of the motion. Staff care to make any comment? It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, are there any questions, comments from council? Mr. Burgoyne? I did have um, some comments, um, six, six comments, which I emailed. Um, is this, can I bring them up now? Please. Yeah. Okay, so from the audit, um, I did see some um, items some our housekeeping. So my comments were that, number one, we should clarify that the city administrator should reasonably follow up on all of the management recommendations that were made, uh, especially so that some of the prior unresolved issues do not reoccur again in the next audit. So that's number one. Number two, um, the uh, pension obligation bonds that were mentioned, uh, my view is that staff should look into the pension, pension obligation bonds because it provides an opportunity to uh, fund MERS, um, the uh, division that's not funded now by above 80%. It provides an opportunity to to fund this at a lower cost than we're being charged now, that's what it appears, and also would allow us to switch from defined benefits to defined contributions if we got above 80% in that division. So it makes sense to look at this um, item that was brought up by the auditors. So that's my second point. Third, um, the staff did show how the reclassified amounts did match uh, the audit final printout that staff had. But the projections sheet still does not match the city's printout. And my view, uh, since the printouts always match the city's sheets, even at the end, we should still maintain having the uh, uh, general fund projections worksheet match the city's sheets and not take into account that the auditors have reclassified because they, they reclassified because of Gatsby requirements. That's, that's the way they do the audit, but that's not the way that we view the budget. So we should continue to view the budget on our terms in our way. And the, the projection sheet should match that. So that's the third point that I, I get out of comparing to the audit. Um, number four, um, the auditors did show the restricted portion of the fund balance. Our fund balance policy that was adopted um, May 6th of this year states that we will look at the non-restricted available portion. So for us to look at that, staff needs to show us the restricted part and the part that we have access to. We do not have access to restricted money. We can't change restricted money. So that's the way it should be presented to us, the restricted and the part that's not restricted, the part that we do have access to. So that, that's the next point that I got out of that. Um, number five, the audit did show a net gain of unspent funds. 
uh, that line was taken out of uh, the projections worksheet. So it doesn't properly estimate the correct target by taking out that line. That line should be included. It had been included in the past. The targets were more on target than they are now. I look back at March. In the, in the um, spreadsheet that we were provided in March, it estimated that in FY16 fiscal year um, 2016, there would be a negative $300,000 in the fund balance. And in the one that was printed after the audit, the post audit printout, showed in FY16 that there would be a positive 1.6 million. That's a $2 million change. And I know that that does include some adjustments that were made um, from, from March. Um, the final projection at the time that the budget was passed um, for what was projected for June 30th, 2013 was exceeded by 237,870. So that 237,870 was not in the projections or no estimate of that number was in the projections. And because of that, we weren't shown something that was as much on target as it could be. And the sixth, sixth item um, that I got out of um, the audit process, and I asked, the, I asked this question to the auditor, and where you have a non-specific contingency amount that the city council votes. The response, after referring to page 32 in the audit document, is that something committed for a yet unknown future item is should be something specifically aside, uh, set aside for the city council for, for a purpose, should be under committed fund balance rather than put within the budget document somewhere else under another line. And right now, we do have an item like that, which is non-specific. It's just for in case some some equipment, some unspecified equipment uh, does go back, go bad. So that should be a committed amount. That should, we, we should use the right terms. And that would make it clearer, that would make it more open, more transparent, more understandable. So those are, those are my items. The, Biggest action items are um, to follow up on what was mentioned in the management letter so that those things are followed up and don't come back next year again. And the, uh, the bond item, uh, the possibility of being able to issue pension obligation bonds at a cost savings, which then allows changing over from defined benefit to defined contribution, which would be a further savings. So. And that item is on for, for discussion this evening, Mr. Burgoyne. Right. Well, I thought that I would discuss it here because it came out of the, out of the audit. So put all of these items out here. These are all housekeeping items, but these are the items that I saw came out of the out of the audit. And I'm just wondering if anybody is opposed to any of these items, opposed to follow up or looking into or 
or so forth. How I did email this to everybody on, on council so that they could look at it. Well, I mean, I can comment to that first, and then, uh, then we can uh, open it up for the entire group. First of all, I appreciate you putting your um, thoughts in writing and providing them to council in advance of this evening's meeting. Um, and needless to say, all the recommendations that were made by Plant Moran um, related to, to clean up and housekeeping will be followed up uh, by, or will be followed up on by staff. Um, I think the real question is when is the appropriate time to do that and when is, when is it not the appropriate time to do that? I think many of these things can be addressed and looked at as part of our upcoming budget, which we'll begin working on uh, in, in just a few months. Um, the only thing I, I have to say again, Mr. Burgoyne, um, and I believe it was when you were discussing um, item number five on your email dated October 20th. I'm still a little disturbed when you make comment in reference to staff not providing council members with all the um, appropriate uh, information and data. Um, I, I, I still take issue with that, and I think just the opposite. I think that any time a council member had a question or concern or wanted to see a particular scenario or piece of data, it was provided. Um, now, if you disagree with the, the recommendation or the approach of staff, that's one thing. But to, to criticize the lack of information, I, 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 I don't think that's fair. So do any other council members have any comments? Mr. Gearbaugh? Yeah, I just wanted to address a couple, few of those. I concur that we should be following up on audit comments in the management letter. We always should do that. Um, unfortunately, some of those comments have appeared for the last three or four years and hadn't been addressed. I do know that Ms. Bennett addressed a large receivable issue that we've had for the last few years and was able to collect that, so I wanted to give her big points for that because I know that was a concern that I didn't understand why that considered, continued to occur every year for three or four years prior to the change in leadership in our financial department. Um, the other item, I'm not sure what your concern with Plant Moran is. If we're not agreeing with the audit numbers, and that we should probably modify our reporting so that it concurs with them because I would be more um, in tune with having our numbers be consistent with Plant Moran unless there's a significant reason as to our need for our reporting aspects. So whenever there's a issue of that concern, we should always address that and look at that and determine how we should handle it for, um, going further. As for fund policy, restricted versus unrestricted, I believe that um, we do identify those aspects. I'm just not sure where the concern is as much as um, how we specifically handle it. Usually when a restricted fund is identified, it's somewhere specifically broken out. And if we aren't having to do that based on our Plant Moran um, control and policies, I think we're fine with that. Um, the other issue, I think, um, when we had some differences in how the numbers are being reported and such, I just think that's a change of our leadership that's happened. And if they want to handle things differently, if Mr. Campbell does, I relate to them and their decision on that at this point. Um, as for projections, they generally are that. They are projections. I think we've attempted to try and make issues. We had some minor changes. I've been through a number of years where our financial activities have wavered significantly at the end of the year, where we've either had to postpone an expense or we've had revenue come in that was unexpected because of some change in the legislature's office. But I do know that for us, we've been doing some major cuts in costs, and hopefully that's what we're starting to recognize. Unfortunately, we're not able to present those clearly as to when those are going to hit or when they're going to um, basically um, be projected out. We're trying to address those. We may benefit from those sooner than later, but I think that's a good way to approach it. Um, and then lastly, speaking about transparency, I think we've been pretty good this year. We've really had a lot of information. I think council has felt, or at least I have, that a lot of the information that had been presented to us has provided that um, idea or the ability to look at the information and understand it perhaps a little more than we have in the past. And um, whatever we need to do in terms of assessing whatever the plant Moran says to us and everything that um, I think we've had that information to us, and I think it's been very good. And regarding the bond pension obligation, I agree that we should look at every option that um, is presented that way. And so if we need to address um, assessing whether that's a cost benefit versus a risk issue, that we should do that. And I'm glad that's on the agenda tonight. Thank you, Mr. Gearbaugh. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Rhodes? I would just say I, I agree with uh, Councilmember Gearbaugh on the, the issue of looking at uh, paying down our MERS obligation. I, I don't know that the bonds is necessarily the right way to do it, and I think the county has backed away from doing that themselves. But um, I, I think anything that we can do to reduce the cost of um, our MERS payments is, is worthwhile looking at. Thank you. 
Mr. Har? Yes, thank you. Um, I would also concur with Mr. Gerbach on the um, comments on the quality and the amount of information we've been getting. It's not really possible for me to separate improvements in and, and increased clarity in the information I'm getting and my increasing experience with looking at this kind of information, but I have found um, this year especially that uh, the information we pre presented was very clear and came to me in a way that allowed me to think about the principles we were working with and um, make what I felt were good decisions. Any other comments? Yeah. Mr. Burgoyne? Um. On, on the um, on the presentation of materials to us, um, I think Mr. Girva said that he wanted to see that we did agree with the audit numbers and that the information was presented to us consistently. Um, I thought I said that. Um, I did not disagree with that. Um, I, the staff did show that they did match up with the audit numbers. But in our presentation, um, we don't change the categories the way they do uh, for, for the audit. We, we have our numbers presented to us according to the way that we budget. And my point was that the projection that we get at the end of the year should be consistent with our method, not with the auditor's method. Not that they can't agree, they do agree, because you can reconcile it by looking to see what the auditors changed. But we should look, we should have our information uh, according to our procedures all the time in a, in a consistent way and not change it at the end of the year. That's all. I, I did not disagree with what you said. Anything else? No? Okay. Then it's been properly moved by Burgoyne, seconded by Gearbach to acknowledge receipt of the annual audit. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ayes have it. The motion carries unanimously. And we move on now to discussion items. First, we come to commission and committee reports. Are there any commission and committee reports? Mr. Hart. Yes, one moment. Well, one moment. Um, the Arts and Culture Committee met on Monday, October 14th. Um, we are moving, working on, on two areas. Um, one is the ongoing work to um, possibly mount the Orange Risden bust outside um, where it was designed to be. Um, and uh, we, uh, at this point, the committee has received uh, final figures from our nets for the granite pieces, engraving, and so on for the mounting. Um, what we still need to do is uh, work with city staff, Mr. Rubel and Mr. Fordyce, about costs for uh, the foundation and installation. Um, and once we have that information, city, city council will be receiving a, a proposal um, to approve or not approve. And then secondly, we are uh, still thinking about the, the locations of the former sculpture walk, um, the sculptures that were on loan to us. Um, and uh, we received um, uh, information from the Celine Area Historical Society proposing the installation of a piece that they currently have um, in storage um, and that they would like to um, have located at the entrance to parking lot number four. Of course, it's not the Arts and Culture Committee's job to approve such a thing, but we did vote to endorse that proposal and I expect that we will be hearing, City Council will be hearing something from the Historical Society about that um, in the future. And then um, additionally, uh, we have begun discussions with uh, Celine High School teachers, art teacher Cindy Koppelman and welding teacher Steve Hasselbeck about uh, supporting stu a student project or project sculpture projects uh, for one or two of the other locations that previously had loaned materials. 
That's it. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Har. There are additional commissioner committee reports. Mr. Rhodes. The Environmental Commission met recently, and the, uh, the bulk of the conversation revolved around a uh, presentation by a representative from the waste management uh, firm about possible improvements to increase the recycling percentages and amounts that we, uh, that we are currently recycling in the, within the community. Um, did not make any uh, conclusions on that at the moment, but uh, we will at some point, and um, we'll pass those on to city staff to potentially incorporate into the, re into the renewed contract with waste management. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rhodes. Any other commissioner committee reports? How about reports or other announcements? I've got, oh, go ahead, Mr. Rhodes, please. Yep, sorry. No, no, quite all right. Um, wanted to report briefly on the Michigan Municipal League Economic Development and Land Use Issue Committee, which I participate in. And for those who may not know, that there are representatives from uh, probably 20 different municipalities across the state that meet about quarterly to evaluate various bills that are um, pending in state legislature. And the first one had to do with uh, crowdfunding, and I did email some information on that to uh, council members and staff today. And what it does basically is to provide a means for entrepreneurs to obtain funding from individuals in smaller amounts without uh, having to submit to all of the regulations that are required by um, various federal groups. And uh, the, one of the stipulations is that it has to be contained within the state so there's no interstate transactions going on. And um, that's the bill that uh, Representative Driscoll referred to earlier. And it has come out of her committee uh, with strong support and seems like it will be moving through the legislature. So I have high hopes for that one. Um, we also supported a bill to prohibit the transfer of a, of a license for a cigar bar or a special retail store unless it was approved by a local unit of government because under the current system, the state can approve those. So this would involve uh, the local municipality. We opposed a uh, House bill, a series of House bills that uh, instead of a vote determining an annexation, um, if the city and township was not successful in creating a PA 425 agreement, that the circuit court would make the determination on annexation. So we were strongly opposed to that. Um, another bill was to uh, provide an avenue for the Michigan Liquor Control Commission for assessing penalties to licensee violators and allows them to uh, require the licensee to pay the local unit of government for any expenses caused by that violation. And we took a position of support with some modification to some of the, the content. Um, Senate Bill 594 allows locals to adopt an ordinance requiring a work permit for those working in the adult entertainment business. Supported that concept again with some modifications. And um, the one that several of us kind of chuckled at is a carrier pigeon legislation which has come up because of a municipality's difficulties with an individual who is in a residential neighborhood and has several hundred of these racing carrier pigeons and causing difficulties. So we supported that particular position. And that's it for MML. Thank you, Mr. Rhodes. Any other announcements? I've got three then. Um, the first of which is I just want to remind all my council colleagues that this Friday here on the city council chambers is our small business summit. So if you have not RSVP'd and your schedule permits, please do so to Ms. Cortman, our business ambassador. But more importantly, I suspect that everyone up here at the dais has a relationship with at least one or two small business owners in the city of Saline. They all should have received a, um, a hard uh, invite in the mail, probably about a month ago. Um, and additionally, I believe this morning, those that are chamber members received an email from Mary Ellis Smith, Smith excuse me, at the chamber reminding them about the event and encouraging them to attend. But what I would ask of you all is because you have relationships <coughs> with some small business owners, please reach out to them in the coming days, invite them to come. Uh, it's at noon here at, uh, at, uh, at City Hall in the council chambers. Free lunch will be provided, and I think the presentations from Main Street, from uh, MEDC, 
um, and from uh, the Michigan Small Business Technology Development Center will be um, really compelling. So um, if your schedule permits, uh, please attend. And again, you know people, and I encourage you to reach out to them um, and encourage them to attend. The other thing, I was invited to a public engagement, or one of four public engagement seminars that HVA is having. Um, and unfortunately, my schedule does not permit me to attend because they're all on either a Wednesday or Thursday, midday, uh, late morning or er early evening, and my work schedule just simply does not permit me to attend, but I would love at least one council member to, uh, to attend on the city's behalf. Um, the dates are the 23rd of this month, um, which is this Wednesday, um, the 14th of November, and then we get into some later um, dates at, at the beginning of next year. Um, so I'll, I'll have this document available at the end of the meeting. And again, if your schedule permits, I'd love for at least one or two people to attend. And I will RSVP uh, on your behalf to, to HVA directly. Mr. Rhodes? And I've already signed up for the November 14th oh, terrific. session okay. and gotten a response from them. Okay, very good. Well, I, I wasn't aware of that. Well, that's, that's excellent. I wanted to make sure at least one person was going to attend. Then I'm assuming you all received this letter. Did you receive this letter in your council packet? I did. Okay, very good. I apologize. <coughs> well, that's I, fine. I hope, uh, hope somebody in addition to Mr. Rhodes is, is able to attend. That's great. The final thing is, um, unfortunately, I've been made aware of the fact, and I've, I've cautioned council members um, to this effect in the past, that um, there has been a conversation between a member of council and an outside vendor or contractor that extended beyond this council dais. And I want to remind everybody that that is inappropriate um, unless you as an individual are empowered by the majority of council to communicate or engage with a, a vendor or contractor or somebody who's going to be providing a service or engaging in business with the city of Saline that is not proper and those sort of inquiries and questions need to go through our city manager's office. Okay. Um, I think that's it for reports or other announcements. Mr. Rhodes? I had one more, if you don't mind. Please. And it is I wanted to give a very brief report on the CQC and SLI um, retreat, which was held last week, Thursday and Friday. For those who don't know, CQC is Coalition for Quality Community. SLI is Saline Leadership Institute. We had representatives from the schools, the city, the library, the senior center, churches, Main Street, the chamber, and a couple of individual residents from the community. Um, the primary activities that took place on the first day um, were, were mostly around a SWAT, which is the strengths, weakness, opportunities, and threats for the Saline area community. And um, that, was, that was quite active. And then on Friday, the primary function was to identify future trends, uh, which we believe might have an impact on the, on the Saline community. And the trends that came out at the top of the list, and these are not in, in any necessary order other than the order that I wrote them down, affordable housing, the aging population, transportation options, boomers moving downtown, downtown development, and the sharing of consumer goods, like tools, equipment, and maybe even cars. So um, there, will be, there will be further um, actions taken with respect to those those individual items by various groups and um, when when there is something worthwhile or appropriate to say I'll, I'll make sure that it gets included thank Great. you well, appreciate your leadership um, and all your efforts to help organize uh, that retreat mr. Rhodes and that an invitate or that uh, acknowledgement is extended I believe to, to Leslie Needhammer and and mr. Campbell and tell me who else was on Scott Graydon. and Scott Graydon on the on the planning committee um, I regret that my schedule only permitted me to attend the first day, but I found it uh, very compelling. Um, Diane, uh, who facilitates a, a number of uh, events um, and discussions in this community, did, did, a, did a fabulous job, as she always does. Um, and it certainly didn't hurt that the, the venue was quite, uh, quite uh, inspiring um, uh, at this time of the year. It's a retreat center in Hillsdale. Uh, and the room that we were in overlooked a, a beautiful pond, and when you could see all the, the leaves and the, the, the shrubbery changing cr colors, it's really quite breathtaking. So um, again, I, I regret I was only able to uh, attend a portion, but I found it very enjoyable and, and worthwhile, and I'm sure that sh uh, those sentiments are shared by Mr. Campbell. Our treasurer was there, and so were uh, Council Members Roth and Gearbaugh. Yeah, great. Thank you. Mr. Campbell, you had something you wanted to share about C click C click fix. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just real quick, wanted to to do a, a promotional 
Um, those that received the, la the most recent FYI would have seen an article um, about C-Click Fix. And so the city's uh, officially rolled it out here um, last week, two weeks ago. Um, and it's an, an app for your smartphone. And it's a, it's a way, we, we talked earlier in the, the work session about property maintenance and the like, and this is a, a way of having um, more eyes and ears out there to help the city. And so you go to the App Store, download, go to C Click Fix, and, and it's uh, GIS based. So depending on uh, if you're in a municipality that offers it besides Celine, um, uh, for instance, I know um, uh, Macon, Georgia offers it. So if I was in Macon, Georgia, it would come up uh, Making Georgia, but since I'm in Celine, it has the Celine um, uh, logo, and it has the different the different buttons. And we actually have so so um, uh, a big reason for this is to so you can use your camera on your smoke, smartphone, uh, take a picture of say a pothole or or whatever it might be, uh, trash, um, you know, graffiti, uh, vandalism, and, and the like, and take a picture, uh, put in the information where it's at. And it will automatically locate. It'll send it to the appropriate department, and then they will um, uh, take action to correct it. Uh, we also have also can use a number of buttons on here. Um, so we also have um, uh, the Parks and Rec. So you you push the Parks and Rec button, and it goes to the Parks and Rec uh, pages of the city website. We also uh, have City Council uh, have uh, you can pay your. Um, utility or t bill or taxes online, Facebook, Twitter, to the, to the city pages. Also, um, we also have a, a button for Main Street, so Celine Main Street web page. We also uh, have discussed very briefly with the schools of possibly adding a button uh, for the schools. So uh, it's a great tool, and so uh, we hope that uh, the more people, the merrier, can, can, can utilize it to, to help us um, uh, Keep keep a lookout and, and keep our community uh, in the best uh, shape that we can. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Um, any other reports or announcements? No. Then we move on to a discussion um, about pension obligation bonds. This is an issue that Mr. Burgoyne brought up at the um, uh, during the uh, discussion um, on the last uh, new business item on the agenda, and also I received a, a communique. From Mr. Rhodes wanting to discuss this. I guess, Ms. Bennett, I might in invite you forward in case people have some questions. Um, but what, what, uh, what's Council's pleasure? Mr. Rhodes, you want to start off and maybe verbalize well, uh, some of your thoughts? Yeah, as I stated earlier in the meeting, it just uh, seems to me that there may be an opportunity there to reduce some of our um, outflow of cash and, and um, perhaps also enable this last group to move to um, defined contribution instead of defined benefit. But I'm not certain of the mechanics. You know, I don't know enough to, to even know what questions to ask. Um, but it did occur to me that I wonder how much it would cost to get to that 80% level and or how much it would cost to completely fund at 100%. And knowing what those two dollar amounts are, then it might become more clear how we could how we could raise that kind of cash well i do know that the um and i'm not sure todd maybe you have more of an answer but that last group which is our general administration and our union non non-union non-staff um have been it, it's still an open but we are now new hires in those groups are in the hybrid plan which is a combination defined benefit and a defined contribution so our police chief and our city clerk who are new hires are in a hybrid where they have the they have the obligation to do a defined contribution and then the city contributes it's a five per, it's about five percent right now on their defined benefit so it's a hybrid plan for all new hires going forward so there is no more um, openings i guess into those other defined benefit all the way the city has closed that gap I think MERS changed the amount required to be able to change us to a hybrid. Is that? I, I believe so. I believe under the new leadership, I believe it's 50% as opposed to 80. But I, um, I, I'm, I will research and get some information. I, I think Todd has already kind of um, talked to Roger Swartz about getting some of the information, and we will be giving you some more information back on that. And what it, you know, 
what the different costs are. Yeah, and what some of the options might be to fund those costs. Okay. Mr. Gearball? I, I was just going to say I'd like to see some scenarios, but especially the risk assessments and whatever, whatever we talk with Roger, potentially what could happen. Because, I mean, that was the concern that happened in Detroit about, but there's such a large amount, and they were trying to fix such a huge problem that we're not in that role. But I still have the concern that I think is a similar thing that came up to Washtenaw County when they discussed this and set that aside and tabled it. And so really is understanding for us either some documentation or whatever that really explains what the what it really means to do something like this and something that's in layman terms, not necessarily the legalese that the state produced. Let me to, to the, the, the um, first point that was raised. Um, Mr. Gearbaugh now and Mr. Rhodes have articulated a desire to see some more data, some more scenarios, and maybe have a discussion <coughs> that I think would probably be most appropriate at a work meeting. Uh -huh. um, Mr. Roth, you're amenable to that? Yes. Okay. Ms. Tahar? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Mr. Peters? Sure. Mr. Burgoyne? Yes. Okay. Mr. Campbell, I'm sorry to cut you off. You had a comment? No, that's exactly what I was going to propose when I, when I talked with uh, Roger. Uh, the day after the, the audit presentation, we talked about that, it, just that of bringing him in for a work session. Okay, very good. What, what sort of time frame? Um, <coughs> just information we can gather in maybe a month and do something maybe at our first meeting in December, sort of as a target? I, I think so. Um, and, and I think I'll, it's doable? I'll talk with uh, Mr. Sweats as far as availability. Okay, right. very good. Okay, anything else on that point, Mr. Burgoyne? And I'll get you, Ms. Tahar. Yeah. The uh, un unfunded liability gap is about $5 million total. Uh, and that's where MERS either gives you credit at 8% or charges you at 8%. So what, and, and historically, it's been in the range of 8% because that's what they make on their money year after year after year, even though it goes up and down, might be 6 to 9%, but it's in that range. So I think um, when we look at it, we should think, um, what are the risks, if any, and also how much less if we bonded 5.2 million or whatever it is, what would that cost be compared to having that unfunded gap where we get charged at 8%? Would we have a savings there? And then if we did bond and pay into MERS, then what could happen is that instead of a hybrid plan, you could actually have a defined contribution plan. So uh, the hybrid plan has gone part of the way. I, I do recognize that, but there, there could still be something there. Make it even with the others. Okay. Ms. Tahar? Yes, oh, thank you. I, um, two things. One, the first about um, potential risk of any given scenario. I, um, during the audit presentation, the auditor alluded to um, the fact that some municipalities have looked at bonding for pension um, and have chosen not to do so and talked about some of the possible risks. Um, and I didn't find any additional information about that in the audit report, though I will confess I skimmed, did not read word for word. Um, so if there is, if this is the kind of information we would get from Mr. Sweats, that's great. But if there's additional information from the auditor that might be relevant, that would be helpful too. Um, and just in general, um, I hope we get a broad look at what the possibilities are and implications rather than zeroing in on sort of one foregone conclusion solution because I, I don't, I'm not comfortable with that. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Hart. Okay. So staff will work on gathering some information and we'll um, hopefully have a work meeting on this. I think we'll aim for our first meeting in December. Okay. There's nothing further on this issue. We move on now to um, the TIFA budget. Mr. Burgoyne requested this be added to uh, the discussion items this evening. Mr. Burgoyne. Well, this is uh, an item that we uh, did talk about before. Um, the TIFA in the past has always paid for its own projects, and I do see in the budget sheets that were handed out to us, uh, two or three possibilities for the TIFA being able to continue to pay for its own projects. So um, the first possibility is um, that 
some of the current projects, such as um, there's $25,000 in here, I believe, for um, a lift station. That's not always used each year. Um, there's some uh, there's some fund balance, and TIFA is actually uh, different from well, it's not actually fund balance; it's carryover project reserve. Uh, TIFA is actually different from funds that hold a fund balance because TIFA is not supposed to hold a fund balance unless it has a purpose, a continuing purpose for it. And um, two other possibilities that I thought of was um, MDOT, I understand, is doing the Ann Arbor Street project. Um, they usually need to be paid up front. Uh, their budget year ends in October. It's not clear to me whether the project needs to be done in May versus July. Maybe their schedule is not flexible if, if they're doing the project and, and maybe you can't do it later. But if you could do it in July and August, which is still within their October budget year, that would be one solution. And the other solution is there's $100,000 in here for planning for the um, Michigan Avenue uh, project, which is in either FY17 or FY18, I'm not from, from what I understand. So some of that could be done now, perhaps using some of the lift station money and some of it could be done in July. I mean, there's, and, and another method of having TIFA pay for its own project is for the TIFA and city council to have the same type of agreement that there was with LBFA2, which is to advance the money from the general fund to be repaid in July. I mean, it, it, there are so many different ways for TIFA to pay for its own project and I, my view continues to be that we should not have taxpayers pay extra from outside of the TIFA for TIFA project because that impacts, that impacts the running of um, the city administration, that impacts what the city can do, that impacts the tax rates. TIFA should pay for TIFA projects, continue to pay. Um, I don't I know what other council members think. This is, this is something that should be resolved. Well, as I previously stated at our last meeting, Mr. Burgoyne, um, you know, your comments and thoughts and suggestions um, are first being forwarded to the TIFA LDFA task force, uh, which I convened earlier this year. That consists of council member um, Gearbaugh. Um, City Manager Campbell serves on that, uh, that task force as a staff liaison, as does our business ambassador, Ms. Korfman. It also includes Andy Lunn, who's the president of the chamber, Art Trapp, who's the executive director of the chamber, Walt Byers, who's a member of our economic development boards and um, a very dedicated um, you know, civic leader, uh, and also a young realtor, Ross Schweitzer, um, and uh, Mitch Rhodes, the owner of Quantum Signal. So um, I know they had a, a meeting that was more... Um, well, more uh, oriented towards uh, uh, the downtown of our community last week. I believe you're meeting again, is it next week, Mr. Gearbaugh? Yeah, sorry, I forgot about that as a task force when we were talking about it. Okay. Yeah, we basically held a meeting downtown to just review and walked around to see what's going on there, but also discuss some of the other concerns and issues, and we'll be coming forward with recommendations. Um, what I think what we would need to look at is I think there's also projects that the TIFA could do that potentially have been... Um, handled differently, and there are things that we could look at in terms of what the TIFA funds and how it funds it. What I'd like to know, though, is where and show the cost detriment or whatever there would be to the city in terms of actual numbers and such, and I don't think I've ever seen that in my time that I've been on the TIFA board. So understanding that whole approach might be something beneficial not only for um, council and then maybe reviewing Mr. Burgoyne's concerns, so that would be more of addressing that aspect and 
whether there's a trade-off or not, but I can bring that up at the next TIFA board. Okay. And, and just to confirm, the, the LDFA TIFA task force is looking at things from a very holistic perspective, um, not only ways in which we can improve our, our downtown and utilize economic development dollars more effectively, but also talking about implementation of the SPARK analysis, how we recruit and retain entrepreneurs and business investment in our community. So they're, they're looking at and dealing with a, a whole host of issues and will hopefully be making some recommendations to, to the full EDC, TIFA, and LDFA boards uh, in the, the not too distant future. At least that's my hope. Mr. Burgoyne? The impact that Mr. Gearba is talking about is taking $150,000 tax-based dollars out of the street fund and putting that to a TIFA project. That's the impact. Um, but the other, $150,000 even if we didn't take it out of the street fund, could be used somewhere else. That's, I mean, we're basically kind of going back and forth, so I'm trying to understand exactly what the total penalty is in terms of, because I always understood from you there was a different rate and such for the TIFA monies. So this whole project and policy, which I never knew was really our policy, that TIFA always pays for its own, um, I think we just need to discuss that further to understand specifically, because if, if we're not all understanding it here on council, then I think we need to basically get down into the details to see what that really means. So again, that will be discussed um, by the LDFA TIFA task force, then move to the economic development boards, and obviously this, this council will be privy to those discussions and eventually chime in. So the issue is not dying, Mr. Burgoyne. It, it will continue, and we, we appreciate your, your thoughts and, uh, and insights. Are there any other comments from council? No? Okay. Then we move on to our last agenda item, which is e economic development. Um, Mr. Burgoyne distributed an article from the Ann Arbor News dated um, October the 13th. Uh, Mr. Burgoyne, would you like to discuss the article? Yeah, there, there were uh, two articles. Um, one is Shape Ypsilanti Master Plan Leaves Industrial Pass Behind. That's one article. Uh, the other, other article is 192 unit apartment complex on Ann Arbor Saline Road up for approval in Pittsfield Township. And I know that there's a similar residential development, similar size, um, going forward in Sayo uh, Township. And um, I think, I just wanted to float this to the other council members to consider I think what's going to happen in the, in the future as the industrial values no longer support the municipalities as much with, with personal property going away, there's going to be a different mix of development, a different approach. Uh, it might be more, something more for the urban areas it might be something more for neighborhoods and so forth. But as uh, also as other communities are developing, uh, what's happening is that their tax base is growing. Um, I just saw it in SEMCOG today um, a projection that in southeast Michigan, the tax base will grow over the next few years. And if we're able to continue to develop in those areas that are developing, and right now it's the housing market, that will help sleep. So it's just information. I just passed it on. Thank you. Appreciate that. Any other discussion items? I have just one to follow up on an email that Mr. Campbell, um, or I believe he might have, you might have addressed it in your weekly communique. I, I can't recall if it was a separate email or part of that, that document. But um, our health insurance enrollment process, staff has determined that that is going to be far less complex than it has been in years past. Um, so it's their determination, their recommendation that we do not need to have a work meeting on that issue, but that the material would be sent out well in advance of the council meeting Ideally, I would think probably the next council meeting or our second one in November where we'd have to act. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So the recommendation from staff, which I'm amenable to unless there are objections, is for staff to um, disseminate email out that, those, those documents um, and then it would come back um, at a subsequent council meeting for, of course, discussion and then action. Unless there are objections, we will proceed in that way. 
Okay, that's good. So that was what we were going to discuss on November the 4th. So there will not be a work meeting on November the 4th, and I can confirm that our veterans reception, which will be serving you know, just some light uh, refreshments and then recognizing um, some veterans, those who have served in our armed forces over the years, um, that will take place at 7 p.m. here in the council chambers. And I'll be preparing a press release and sending that out to all of you before we disseminate it to our, our contacts in, uh, in the local media. So again, no work meeting on the 4th with a reception beginning at 7 p.m., which you are all welcome and encouraged to attend. And then currently we do not have a work meeting scheduled for November the 18th, just a regular meeting at 730. Okay. Mr. Gearbot, I cut you off there. Just real quick, I know this was in our packet. Is this an update on our quarterly, or basically on our goals and such that Mr. Campbell included? Yes. If there's things that we want to address on here, um, are we going to have a discussion, or should I just, I mean, not necessarily address, but actually, I think there's some things on here that you did achieve that aren't on here. So. If you want to take a look at that, well, he and I spoke about the issue briefly prior to tonight's meeting, and that's going to come back for review and a more substantive discussion okay. at our next meeting on the 4th. Great. Okay? That's fine. But if I, I may, no please. But if I may, uh, Mr. Mayor, but if you certainly, I'm uh, open to uh, uh, comments, um, so... Well, please feel free to share those with me. Okay. I didn't know what the period, I mean, I figured it's for the first quarter, right? Correct. First quarter. If there are no further discussion items, we come now to the public comments. Uh, under the Open Meetings Act, any citizen may come forward at this time and make comment or question to City Council. This public comment period will be limited to three minutes per person. Anyone who would like to speak is requested, but not required to state his or her name and address for the record. Are there any citizen comments? There are no citizen comments, okay? Then again, our next meeting is on November 4th with a veterans reception at 7 p.m. here in council chambers. And then our next regular meeting is on November the 18th. Again, we will not be having a work meeting, just a regular meeting at 7.30 p.m. There are no absences this evening, so we can dispense with that. And if there is nothing further, I would seek a motion to adjourn at 9.35 p.m. So moved. Been moved by Gearbach to adjourn at 9.35 p.m. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mayor Pro Tem Tahar. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ayes have it. This meeting's adjourned.